Good afternoon from Miami. This is Dr. John Bennett with another episode of uh, the neurosurgery series uh, started by Ulrich uh, Sydney from Cameroon, Africa. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having Dylan Geofac, a medical student from Cameroon. He's going to present the ventricular system. Uh, and now let's meet the guest before we turn it over to Dylan. Hello, Marco. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, nice to meet you. My name is uh, Marco Meloni. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon in uh, Italy, uh, close to Como. Pretty soon he's going to be giving a presentation. Uh, okay, let's see. Is Natalie? Is, okay, Christelle, Christelle, are you there? Okay, Christelle, can you bring me? Yeah, uh, hello, I'm Natalie Christelle from Cameroon. I'm a general practitioner and aspiring neurosurgeon. And she's showing what this tech can do. She's in her car, but she's a passenger. She's not the driver. Yeah, yeah I'm not the driver. She's not the driver. <laughs> okay, Ulrich, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Ulrich Sydney here. My name is a medical student and a research associate at Harvard's program in uh, global surgery and social change. Nice to meet you all, and thank you for coming. You're welcome, Ulrich. Okay, Dylan, welcome, and it's all yours. Thanks, John. Welcome, everyone. I'm Dylan Jofak from, from Cameroon, seventh-year medical student and member of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. So today we'll be talking about the surgical anatomy of the ventricular system. Knowing that uh, ventricular pathologies are frequent diseases, especially in kids, so it's a really very important chapter. So let me share. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Very good. Looks good. Looks good. Okay. So, in order to to talk about this chapter, we're going to follow a plan. So, in our plan, we have a, a brief introduction about what the ventricles are. We're going to talk about the embryology, how the the, the ventricles. Form. We're going to, to go a little bit in detail in the anatomy of the ventricular system. We're going to talk about the cerebrospinal fluid a little. We're going to uh, see the clinical relevance of this ventricular system anatomy and discuss some surgical approaches. So as an introduction, ventricles are these intracerebral CSF field cavities. They originate from the central canal of the embryonic, embryonic neural tube and aligned with ependymal cells. So in the adult brain, they are organized in a system of two lateral ventricles, telencephalic ventricles, and then two midline ventricles, which are the diencephalic ventricle, the third ventricle, and cerebellopontine ventricle, which is the fourth ventricle. Each of these ventricles communicate through uh, canals Precisely, the two lateral ventricles communicate with the third through the foramen of Monroe, and then the, the, the third communicates with the fourth through the cerebral aqueduct or aqueduct of Sylvius. So embryologically, the ventricular system being cavity, a, cavity, a system of cavities inside the, the brain forms following the development of the encephalon. So they originate from the central canal of the embryonic neural tube. And then as the brain develops, the cavities too develop. So such that the telencephalon, for example, as it develops and extends laterally and in the caudal direction forming the hemispheres, the cavities present in the telencephalon are going to develop to form the two lateral ventricles within each hemisphere. And later on, these ventricles will be separated by the septum pellucidum. The same process applies to the diencephalon, where the thalamus, the hypothalamus structures are present, to the midbrain and then the hindbrain, wherein as they progressively develop, the cavities inside the, the corresponding structures will form. So in an adult brain, these CSF filled cavities, as we said earlier, communicate with each other through the lateral ventricles communicate with the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe, and then the third communicate with the fourth through the aqueduct of Sylvius. So taking one ventricle at a time, we're going to see, first of all, the lateral ventricles. So lateral ventricles can be described as C-shaped cavities. 
surrounding the thalamus. So as we see here, I don't know if everybody sees my cursor. As we see here, these are the lateral ventricles, these C-shaped cavities filled with cerebrospinal fluid that surround the thalamus, which is normally located here. So each lateral ventricle has five parts. We have an anterior horn present in the frontal lobe. We have a body which is present in the parietal lobe. We have an atrium, an occipital horn or a posterior horn, and then a temporal horn or an inferior, inferior horn. Each of these parts of the lateral ventricle have a medial and a lateral wall a roof and a floor, but more to that, the frontal and temporal horns and the atrium have an anterior and a posterior wall too. So we're going to see a little bit the relationships that these lateral ventricles have with the surrounding uh, brain parenchyma. So these lateral ventricles have neural relationships, precisely the basal ganglia, amongst which we talked about the thalamus, the coded nucleus and the nuclei. So we, as we can see here, these are the lateral ventricles. Yeah, I don't know if everybody can see my cursor. These are the lateral ventricles here. And then we see the, thalam the thalamus, this yellow structure here. We can see the coded nucleus here, surrounding the thalamus and then in contact with the lateral ventricles. Apart from that, we have the septum pellucidum, which, sep which um, uh, uh, links the, 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 the fornices to, to the, the corpus callosum. We have fibers of the white substance, which go through the corpus callosum, the fornices, and the internal capsule. So here again, we can see the coded nucleus, the head, the body, the tail, in close contact with the lateral ventricles here, and then this part, the cingulate gyrus. So, and this is the thalamus here. Again, here we can, we can see the, the, the surrounding uh, encephalic fibers. We have the part of the corpus callosum. We have the lateral ventricle from an inferior view here with part of the, the rostrum of the corpus callum, callosum here, the genu of the corpus callosum with the surrounding white substance fibers in close contact to the lateral ventricle here in translucent blue. The same diagram here, but from a lateral view with the fibers of the corpus callosum, the coded nucleus, the thalamus in the middle, and then parts of the lateral ventricle. So apart from these neural relationships, we have vascular relationships. Important arterial and venous structures are in close relation with the lateral ventricles. And this makes it relevant because during a surgical procedure, for example, these blood vessels, especially the main arterial blood vessels, be they the anterior and posterior choroidal arteries or the main draining veins, the basal vein, and then the internal cerebral vein have to be protected during the surgical procedures, avoiding lesions of these vascular relationships include we have arterial, as we said, the anterior and posterior choroidal arteries, the venous structures, we have the anterior septal superior choroidal vein, medial and lateral. I don't know if you can see my so I almost tried the inferior ventricular vein and here we have here part of a part of the a part of the basal vein here some septal veins thalamostride vein that causes here we have the posterior septal vein here and then we have the vein of gallon here as part of the veins that are in close relationship with the, the lateral ventricles. Here we have a diagram showing the arterial relationships. We have the branches of the anterior 
branches of the internal carotid arteries and then the posterior cerebral arteries, knowing that the internal carotid arteries will give the anterior cerebral and the mid cerebral arteries. So all these branches are in close relationships, be it with the foramen of Monroe or the temporal horn of the lateral ventricles and represent delicate structures to be taken care of during the surgical procedures. Now, within the lateral ventricles, talking about the frontal horn, it is that part of the lateral ventricle, of each lateral ventricle, that's located anterior to the foramen of Monroe. So as we can see here, this part located anterior to the foramen of Monroe, the frontal bound, the frontal horn as each horn has boundaries. So the is uh, demarcated by the rostrum of the corpus callosum, the head of the caudate nucleus, its roof demarcated by the inferior surface of the most anterior part of the callosal trunk. We have the medial wall of the frontal horn, which is del del delimited by the septum pellucidum and the columns of the cornix, of the fornix, and the anterior wall delimited by the genu of the corpus callosum and then the lateral wall by the coded nucleus head. So here we see a better representation with the roof, part of the roof, uh, uh, delineated by part of the roof delineated by the genu of the corpus callosum, the lateral wall in part delineated by the coded nucleus and part of the rostrum of the corpus callosum, that wall by the coded nucleus, the floor by the rostrum, and then the medial portion by the septum pellucidum and inferiorly to by the rostrum. Again, here we have a diagram, an image here. We see the, the frontal horns on each side. We see the coded nucleus for the lateral wall and then the genu of the corpus callosum. And further, when the genu extends, we form the rostrum of the corpus callosum, which will still be part of the structures delineating the, the, the anterior wall of the frontal horn. So again, here we have the frontal horn besides the body of the corpus callosum, which we'll see later, and then the atrium behind. So as, as we were saying, um, concerning the, bound, the boundaries of the body of the lateral ventricle. So we have the roof. The roof is delineated by the body of the, carpo, the corpus callosum. The medial wall is superiorly delineated by the septum pellucidum and inferiorly by the body of the phonics. The lateral wall is delineated by the body of the caudate nucleus, as we can see here. The floor is delineated laterally to medially by the caudate nucleus. The stria terminalis, that's supposed to be here, we'll see it in, the, in, the, in a better image. The stria terminalis, the thalamus, triad vein, the thalamus, here, thalamus, and then the choroid plexus here. So the striatal terminalis and the thalamus striate vein pass in the striothalamic groove. So most often it will be a little bit difficult to see directly the stri the striatal terminalis and the thalamus striate vein. What will be represented will be the stria, the striothalamic groove. The body contains the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus is generally located in the body of the lateral ventricle and the inferior horn and is continuous with the third ventricle. So as you can see here, we have a diagram as it shows the roof, the body of the corpus callosum, the floor, which is really very important because when we have surgical procedures, for example, that um, trans callosal surgical procedures, which will go through the corpus callosum here and then get into the lateral ventricles and for some procedures get from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle, we have to master the structures of the floor of the lateral ventricles because some vital structures that have to be avoided and a particular route that has to be taken necessitates the mastery of the anatomy of the floor. So as we saw late, uh, earlier, we have the coded nucleus for the floor. We have the stria terminalis. We have the thalamus stride vein. We have the choroid plexus. We have um, 
I'm striving in the correct place to Can other people hear me? Yes, I can hear you, John. But uh, you can you you cannot hear Dylan, correct? Yeah, right. Uh, probably okay. the, the okay, Wi-Fi crash again. again. Okay. The code is Oh, it's starting. Hmm. So and so. Okay, go ahead, Dylan. Are you okay? Naturally here. Okay, we're just having some bandwidth issues here. Maybe if we just hang on this time, it'll be okay. John, I can get you. Yeah, know. we're just waiting for Dylan's Wi Fi to kick in. I think he fell off again. Let me pause the recording. Okay, so as we're talking about the atrium and the occipital horn, they form a roughly triangular structure with an apex in the occipital lobe, and then uh, the base in, at the level of the pole venar, the posterior part of the thalamus. So talking about the atrium, it opens anteriorly above the thalamus into the body, and below the thalamus into the temporal horn and posteriorly into the occipital horn. It, it itself, it has boundaries as each part of the lateral ventricles. It has a, uh, the roof is covered by the body, the splenium and the tapetum of the corpus callosum, some part of the fibers of the corpus callosum. The medial wall is represented by two, presents two prominences, the bulb of the corpus callosum which, has, which covers the fibers of the forceps major, as we can see here, the bulb of the corpus callosum, and then the lower prominence, which is represented by the calcar avis, which, is, which covers the deepest part of the calcarine suture, calcarine sulcus. So the lateral wall on its own part has an anterior part represented by the caudate nucleus, which we can see here, we'll show later, Caudate nucleus, and then the posterior part, which is presented by the fibers of the tapetum, a part of the corpus callosum. It has an anterior wall, which is uh, represented by the medial part of the crus of the fornix, and then the lateral part is represented by the porvinor. So, as we can see here, it has a floor two, which is presented by the collateral trigon. Inside the, the, the atrium, we have a, a, a prominence of the the choroid plexus, which is named the glomus. So as you can see here, the atrium here, we have the temporal horn, which extends down here. And then here we have the calca avis, the inferior lateral prominence of the lateral wall of the atrium. We have the hippocampus, which is part of the, 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 temp the limiting structures of the temporal horn. And then here we see again the atrium with the glomus, the prominent structure of the choroid plexus here, and then the atrium right here. Right here. Again, Again, we see the collateral trigon, which we talk about at the level of the floor of the atrium. We see the calcar avis, which is not well represented here. We see the glomus again, which is the prominence of the choroid plexus at the level of the atrium. Another representation just to show the calcar avis. The, the, the collateral trigon, which is not well represented here, and here is the atrium. So talking about the occipital horn, it is that part of the lateral ventricle that extends posteriorly into the occipital lobe. It varies in size from being present, or um, it may not be present in some cases, so its, it's size really varies. It can be really pro prominent or maybe absent in some cases. So it has a medial wall, which is presented by the bulb of the corpus callosum, as we said for the atrium, and the calcar avis. So it has practically the same wall as the, 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 the atrium. The roof 
and the lateral wall are represented by the tapetum, fibers of the corpus callosum, and the floor is represented by the collateral trigon. Concerning the temporal horn, it is that part that from the lateral uh, ventricle that extends from the atrium below the pulvina. So it is this part that extends below the pulvina to where and ends anteriorly behind the amygdaloid structures, the amygdala in a blunt end. So it extends from the atrium below the pulvina and ends at the level of the amygdala here. So it too has a floor medially represented by the hippocampus overlying the hippocampal formation, laterally represented by the collateral prominence, which we saw at the level of the atrium. It has a roof medially repre represented by the inferior superior surface of the thalamus and the tail of the caudate nucleus, we'll see that later. And then laterally represented by the tapetum of the corpus callosum. This tapetum, which represents fibers of the corpus callosum, is what separates the temporal temporal horn from the optic radiation. So during surgical procedures at the level of the temporal horn, care has to be taken because just above this lateral part of the roof of the temporal horn, we have immediately the, the optic radiations. And lesions at this level would cause really serious damage as far as the, the, the visual capacities of the patients is uh, concerned. So here we have a representation. We have the tapetum here, level of the medial region. We have the caudate nucleus, we have the thalamus, we have the hippocampus, the fimbri, and here we have the collateral sulcus with the collateral prominence just posterior. And here we have the choroid plexus inside the temporal horn. As we said, the choroid plexus is present at level of the body of the, of the lateral ventricle and the inferior horn, which is also the temporal horn, and is continuous with the roof, with the choroid plexus in the roof of the third ventricle. So here again, we can see for the temporal horn, we have the amygdala here, temporal or horn ends just behind the amygdala. We have um, just medial to the temporal horn, the putamen, the globus pallidus. We have the thalamus here and the atrium just behind here. We have the hippocampus at the level of the floor of the temporal horn. So another representation, the hippocampus here, the amygdala just ahead. We have the glomus just behind the level of the atrium and the collateral prominence that extends here. Collateral eminence, collateral trigon, the atrium, and then the glomus and the surrounding structures of the temporal horn. So another important structure at the level of the lateral ventricle is the choroidal fissure, because this is uh, like a cleft that gives passage to many important structures inside the lateral ventricle and permits uh, the passage from the lateral ventricles to many part of other many parts of other ventricles during surgical procedures. So this is a C-shaped cleft between the phonics and the thalamus. So here we have the phonics. I don't know if everybody can see my cursor. Here we have the phonics that extends here surrounding the, the foramen of Monroe here. And then here we have the thalamus laterally. So this is the choroidal fissure here. So it extends as an arc C shape from the foramen of Monroe through the superior, posterior and inferior surfaces of the thalamus that we'll see later till the temporal lobe. Its outer margin is formed by the phonix and the inner margin by the thalamus, depending on which side of the lateral ventricle we are. So it is formed by eight weeks, by, by eight weeks of intrauterine development, by the protrusion of the choroid, the vascular pia matter of the choroid plexus found in the third ventricle, which protrudes into the cavities of the lateral ventricles, which are the cavities of the cerebral hemispheres. So as we said earlier, this choroid plexus is continuous with this third ventricle. And actually, it is a protrusion of this third ventricle through the, the choroidal fissure that forms this, um, this choroid plexus at the level of the lateral ventricles. The limits of the choroidal fissure are, depending on which part of the lateral ventricle we are found, in the body it is lim limited superiorly by the body of the phonics and inferiorly by the thalamus, 
in the atrium, it's limited anteriorly by the porvina, the posterior part of the thalamus, and posteriorly by the cross of the fornix. In the temporal horn, inferiorly by the fimbri of the fornix and superiorly by the thalamus and the stria terminalis. So here we can see better the choroid fissure. Here we have the fornix. Here we have the thalamus. And we have this cleft between the two that extends at the left from the body through from the foramen of Monroe that is formed here through the superior, posterior, and inferior surface of the thalamus here. So it is this cleft through which we can see the choroidal uh, plexus here. So here we are looking at the the frontal lobe, we are looking at the, 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 the lateral ventricles from the frontal point of view, you can see the frontal part of the, of the choroidal fissure. We are looking here from an occipital point of view, we can see the part that goes posteriorly to the thalamus here. And then looking from an inferior temporal point of view, we see the part that goes into the temporal lobe, just inferior to the thalamus here in yellow, the lateral ventricles beside. So this choroidal feature is really relevant because it is the thinnest side of the world of, of the lateral ventricles, bordering the basal systems and the roof of the third ventricle. So through this choroidal feature, the surgeon, the neurosurgeon has access to basal systems de depending on which side from which uh, the, he opens the choroidal fissure. So it provides passage to for the entry of choroidal arteries, vital structures which present here and the exit of ventricular veins to the internal cerebral, the basal, and the great veins. So it's really important structure. More to that, as we said, it provides access to several ventricular and periventricular structures, which we'll see just later. When we open this cleft from the body of the ventricle, we have access to the velum interpositum. We have access to the roof of the third ventricle. When we open, this cleft from the atrium, we have access to the quadrigeminal systems. We have access to the pineal region, just posterior bet uh, between the two thalami, the, the, the posterior wall of the third ventricle. We have access to the posterior region, the posterior portion of the ambient system. And when we open this cleft from the temporal horn, we have access to the structures in the ambient and posterior part of the crural systems. So here we can see again, here we are opening the cleft from the body as it shows here. I don't know if everybody can see my cursor. We are opening the cleft from the body. And as we can see here, we have the phonix. Here we have the thalamus and here we have the cleft. When we open the cleft, we have access to the massa intermedia, which is the the, the structure that links the two thalami just below. So which indicates that we are directly into the third ventricle just below. So as we open this choroid, uh, uh, choroidal fissure, we have access to the third ventricle just below from its roof, as we'll see later in the third ventricle. Here we're opening it from the temporal side of the choroidal uh, fissure. And as we can see, we have access to the basal veins, the, the, the quadrigeminal system that's seen a little bit later, the, a little bit deeper. And here we opening it from the atrium. We have access to posterior choroidal artery. We have access to the pineal region, the pineal gland here, and then uh, the, the, the crural systems and the ambient systems, which has seen a little bit uh, difficulty, difficultly here. So concerning the foramen of Monroe, which is the, the main structure that permits communication between the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. It is these structures that um, is found that, commu that permits communication on both sides of the midline, as we said, with the third ventricle, communication of the lateral ventricle with the third ventricle. So it too has borders. It is bordered by the septum pellucidum, the corpus callosum, the caudate nucleus, the thalamus, and the phonix. It's represented here two, these two foramina on each side. So here we see the relationships. We see the phonix. We see the phonix here. We see the caudate nucleus. We see the thalamus. And an important structure 
to consider during the, the transfer aminal approaches is the genu of the corpus calo of the of the internal capsule, because this genu is found just lateral to the, the foramen of Monroe. So during transfer aminal uh, uh, surgical procedures, consideration has to be taken not to touch the genu of the corpus callosum, as we know that the corticonucleate fibers pass through this genu of the, the internal capsule. So care has to be taken not to, to, to cause any damage to this region during the transfer aminal procedures. Again, here we see uh, 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 an, an image that depicts the, the relationships of the, 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 the foramen of Monroe on each side. We see a part of the column of the fornix. We see the, the, the foramen of Monroe. We see through the foramen of Monroe, we have access to the mass. Intermedia, which is found directly in mass closure. And here we see the choroidal fissure, for, which is posterior just to the foramen of Monroe, as itself extends from the foramen of Monroe backwards. Sorry. Okay. So directly into the third ventricle, it is this slit like cavity in the diencephalon as represented here, because here from the lateral view, it's a little bit larger, but when we look from an anterior view, it is really a slit like cavity. And it extends from the lamina terminalis in front here, anteriorly, to the beginning of the cerebral aqueduct, just posteriorly here. So here we can see it to the third ventricle here. And this third ventricle communicates on both sides with the lateral ventricle, superior superior anteriorly through the foramina of Monroe, and then inferiorly with the fourth ventricle through the aqueduct of Silvius, the midline cerebral aqueduct. So this third ventricle has very important boundaries, as we know that this third ventricle can be the site of some intracerebral, intraventricular tumors. So the third ventricle has an anterior wall, I don't know if everybody sees my cursor, an anterior wall that extends from the foramen of Monroe to the optic chiasma here. This anterior wall is formed by the column of the fornix. Sorry, the column of the fornix here, the anterior commissure here. The lamina terminalis just ahead here. It has a posterior wall which extends between the aqueduct here and the supraspinal recess here. The posterior wall just in yellow here. Habenula commissure in the superior lamina of the pineal region. The habenula commissure, the pineal gland in itself, and then the posterior commissure here just below the pineal gland and then the cerebral aqueduct itself, the entrance of the cerebral aqueduct. Its lateral wall is formed by the thalamus and the hypothalamus here. And then the roof is formed by the column of the fornix and the choroid plexus that hangs just from the roof of the third ventricle. Its floor, which is a very important structure during surgical procedures, extends from the region of the aqueduct here to the chiasma. So this blue colored surface here is the floor. And this floor is made up of the optic chiasma here, the pituitary infundibulum here, the tuba cinerium between the pituitary infundibulum and the mammillary bodies, the tuba cinerium here, the mammillary bodies, the posterior perforated substance here, and the tegmentum part of the midbrain here. So this bluish structure represents the floor of the third ventricle. Going further here, we look at the third ventricle from its roof. As we said, the roof is formed by the phonix here. This is the choroidal fissure and we have the thalamus laterally. So as we open the roof, from the lateral ventricle, the body of the lateral ventricle, 
we see that here we open through the choroidal fissure here. And then later, when we completely separate the, the, the structures of the choroidal fissure, as well as the blood, the blood vessels present in this fissure, we have directly access to the third ventricle just below. Further opening the third ventricle, the anterior commissure, which is the post, the, which is the part of the anterior wall of the third ventricle. We can see the anterior commissure here. We can see the lamina terminalis just below the anterior commissure. We can see the chiasmatic recess just ahead. As we can see here, here's another representation, the anterior commissure, as we see here. Here we have the lat lamina terminalis, which is represented here. The, the chiasmatic recess just behind. And then we have the, the optic chiasma here. And then we have the infundibular recess in the third ventricle just behind here. Here we have the mammillary bodies here, which are part of the floor of the, of the third ventricle. Here again, we see still the anterior commissure, the lamina terminalis, we see it better still. Lamina terminalis, we see the chiasma, the chiasmatic recess just ahead, and then the infundibular recess. So opening now this wall from anterior portion, precisely the lamina terminalis, which is here, as we said, the, the part of the anterior wall of the third ventricle, opening from the lamina terminalis, we can see part of the floor of the third ventricle and part of the posterior wall of the third ventricle. Very important representation because during surgical procedures, depending on if our procedure is transcalosal or transcortical, or if uh, um, we are trying to access the, the, the third ventricle from one of these procedures, we need to really master the, the, the structures of the boundaries of the third ventricle, be it the floor, anterior wall, the roof, the posterior, lateral, and medial walls. So further, here we still see the lamina terminalis here. And as we open, greater we see the third ventricle. So we see the third ventricle here with the anterior commissure here, and then the third ventricle just posterior, knowing that we have opened the, the lamina terminalis here. So here we have a representation of the vascular structures that uh, so the, the vascular relationships. So we have, as we said, part of the floor of the third ventricle is represented by the perforated the perforated substance, which is actually a region of the floor, which is perforated by the branches of the posterior cerebral artery. So the posterior perforated substance is actually that part perforated by the branches of the posterior cerebral artery. Apart from that, we see anterior cerebral artery, we have the, the precala artery, we have um, the lamina terminalis just here, and here we go. Here we have a representation of the superior surface of, the, of the, the brain. As we can see, we have the optic chiasma, we have the infundibulum, the, the, the pituitary stalk, where we'll see the infundibulum. We have um, the, up, the, the, the tuba scenarium here. We have the tuber scenario, we have the mammillary bodies, we have the posterior perforated substance, and then we have a structure which we, we, we are not seeing really very well. So this is like a representation of the floor of the, the third ventricle. Here we have the vascular structures, the vascular relationships, these blood vessels which we have to, to consider during procedures through this floor because these blood vessels really intimately related to the midbrain can be injured during the surgical procedure. 
Again, here we have opening from the floor of the third ventricle. On the floor of the third ventricle, we have the massa intermedia between the two telomeres. We have the anterior commissure, part of the anterior of the wall of the, the anterior wall of the third ventricle. We have the lamina terminalis just ahead. We have the chiasma just ahead, the infundibular recess. So this is an opening from the floor of the third ventricle. Talking about the recesses, we the, the third ventricle has three of uh, five recesses, sorry. Third ventricle has five recesses. We have an infundibular recess, which is a tunnel shaped structure extending from the infundibulum to, from the infundibular of the hypo, hypophysis. So here is not really easily seen, but if we think about the pituitary stalk, just above we have the infundibular recess here. Second recess, we have the optic recess or the chiasmatic recess, which is that angular recess um, here, I don't know. If, this angular recess here is at the junction between the anterior wall and the floor of the third ventricle. So we have this angular recess just found above the optic chiasma. We have the anterior recess or the valve of the third ventricle, which is between the anterior commissure and the foramen of Monroe. So here's the foramen of Monroe. We have the anterior recess not well shown here. We have the supraspinal, suprapineal, sorry, suprapineal recess just above the pineal gland here. Just a piece of pineal gland. We have the suprapineal recess. And then we have the pineal recess, which is found just anterior to the pineal gland between the superior and the inferior lamina of the pineal gland. So just anterior to the pineal gland here, we have the pineal recess, recess. So here again, we have the vascular relationships as we described with the arterial and the venous vascular relationships. Now talking about the fourth ventricle, it is that tent like cavity in the hind brain. So as we can see, it's really like a tent here. It's really that tent-like structure in the hind of the of the in the cavity tent-like cavity in the hind brain that's located between the pons, the posterior part of the pons, and the posterior superior part of the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum posteriorly. So it communicates above with the third ventricle through the aqueduct. Of, Sylvius, of Sylvius here, third ventricle just above, we have the aqueduct of Sylvius, and inferiorly with the, it's continuous with the, the central spinal canal, central, yeah, the central spinal canal. So it too has boundaries. We have lateral boundaries. Superlaterally, we have the, the superior cere cerebellar peduncle here. Inferiorly, we have the inferior cerebellar peduncles. Here, the gracile, the gracile, and the cuneate tubercles. Here, both of them on each side. We have the floor, which is also called the rhomboid fossa because it is it has a rhomboid shape. Here, no, my cursor has gone to. Here, we have the floor of the fourth ventricle, which is rhomboid shape called the rhomboid fossa and delineated superlaterally by the superior cerebellar peduncles here. Inferolaterally by the inferior cerebellar peduncles not well represented here, They're rather here. And then the gracile and the cuneate tubercles besides, and inferiorly by the posterior wall of the pons, which we are not uh, seeing here well, the posterior wall of the pons here, and the posterior wall of the medulla oblongata. So concerning the roof of the fourth ventricle, we have an, op an upper slop sloping part, which is represented by the superior medullary velum. We have the cerebellar lingula, which is not well represented, and then the fastigium. The lower sloping surface of the tent-like structure is represented by the inferior medullary velum, not well represented here. And then the nodulus, the the uvula and then the ependyma at the level of the choroid plexus. 
So the fourth ventricle too has recesses. It has two lateral recesses at the, at the ends of which we can see the two lateral apertures of Lushka, Lushka. It has one dorsal median recess and then two dorsal lateral recesses. So looking a little bit at uh, the physiology concerning these ventricular structures, we, we, have the, we know that in this ventricular system, we have the cerebrospinal fluid, which is produced by the choroid plexus, by a process of filtration, uh, uh, bringing into contribution an active and a passive transport with, pa with passage of structures from the blood vessels in the choroid plexus here to the intraventricular cavities here. These cerebrospinal fluids circulate into the ventricular system. So when produced from the choroid plexus into, in the lateral ventricles, it circulates from the lateral ventricles through the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle. From the third ventricle, it goes through the aqueduct of Silvius into the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, it goes either into the, the, the the, the central spinal canal, central medullary canal, or to the subarachnoid spaces from the fourth ventricle through the lateral foramina of Lushka and the medial foramina of medial foramen of Magendi, medial cerebellar foramen. After circulating into the subarachnoid spaces, this cerebrospinal fluid is reabsorbed at the level of the, the pachyone granulations, which extend from the arachnoid surface, these pachyonic granulations protrude into the, the venous sinuses and then permit the, the reabsorption of the cerebrospinal fluid through bulk vacuolar flow. So this cerebrospinal fluid is once reabsorbed into the, the, the venous system passes through the sagittal veins or the, the, the cerebral veins and then goes to the, the, the jugular vein and goes back to the heart uh, to continue the, the blood circulation. So in cases in which we have, we can have an obstruction of this cerebrospinal fluid flow at the level of one or more of these communicating canals, be it at the level of the lateral apertures of Lushka or at the level of the third ventricle or the aqueduct or the two foramina of Monroe. So when there's this obstruction, there's stagnation of cerebrospinal fluid above the obstruction and then dilatation of the, the corresponding superior ventricles. So generally in kids, we have this disease called the hydrocephalus, the, the, the increase in cerebrospinal fluid uh, pressure in the brain with dilatation, corresponding dilatation of the intracerebral ventricles. We have the clinical signs, which will be signs of raised intracranial pressure, which will be presented in a, in a varied manner, depending on if it is a child or an adult. We have uh, signs of raised intracranial pressure, vomiting, headache, uh, uh, blurred vision. We have, uh, uh, in these kids, we have the dilatation of the superficial cerebral uh, uh, veins. We have this uh, uh, sun setting eyes, which are all signs of a difficult flow of cerebrospinal fluid into the, the, in the ventricular system, and which we find in this uh, case most often when they have hydrocephalus, for example. So concerning the surgical procedures, because amongst the diseases that we have in the ventricular system, most often the clinical presentations will be linked to an obstruction of the flow of cerebrospinal fluid in this ventricular system. But the cause can be variable, uh, being infectious, for example, in the cases of tuberculosis meningitis, or in the cases being tumoral, most often when the patient has a tumor and obstructs, tumor that obstructs the passage, be it at the level of the foramina of Monroe, third ventricle, or in any other structure. So the surgical approaches would depend on whether it's a lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, or the fourth ventricle. So in the lateral ventricles, generally, the surgical approach is either transcortical, that is, it goes through the cortical, the parenchyma of the, of the cortex, the cerebral cortex, or it's transcallosal, in, that, in which case it goes through the corpus callosum. So these are some of the, the, the surgical procedures depending on the, the, the 
part of the lateral ventricle which is targeted, the frontal horn, the body, the atrium or the trigon, the temporal horn, the occipital horn. So one of the most used surgical procedures is the anterior interhemispheric transcalosal procedure, which goes through, as the name implies, the trans goes through the corpus callosum and permits access <clears throat> to the frontal horn, to part of the corpus callosum, and in part the third ventricle. So as we can see here, we go through the corpus callosum without touching the, 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 cere the cerebral cortical tissue and the white substance. Here we have an image that depicts a little bit the procedure, transcalosum, separating the, 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 the superior sagittal sinuses and superior cerebral veins, and getting through the corpus callosum into the third ventricle, for example, if uh, into the, the lateral ventricle, sorry, with the foramina of Monroe on both sides. So here, at least we, we see the surgical procedure. Once in the lateral ventricle, we have we can either go through the fornix, the lateral part of the fornix, or to the choroidal fissure itself. Another procedure is the transfrontal transcortical approach, which, as the name implies, goes through the 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 the, the, cerebr the, the cerebral cortical tissue and then goes through that tissue at the level of the frontal lobe. Most often this surgical technique is not, uh, 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 actually literature says that going through this cortical portion of the frontal lobe cuts through the, the, the fibers of the white substance at the level of the frontal lobe and may be associated with post-operatory seizures, for example. But in some cases, this surgical procedure seems to be the best at it, as it provides access not only to the frontal, to the frontal um, horn of the lateral ventricle, but also foramina of the uh, foramina of Monroe and the, the roof of the third ventricle. So here it goes through the cerebral cortical tissue to access the frontal horn. Here, here we have the arrow that shows how the procedure goes, and once we cut through. I don't know if so we cut through this cerebral tissue. We have access to the lateral ventricle and level of the frontal horn here. We have the furnaces, we have the foramina of Monroe. And depending on which part we are trying to access, we can either even go through the, the choroidal fissure here, or uh, depending on the objective, if we have a tumor to remove in the lateral ventricle or go directly to the third ventricle. Another procedure is the posterior interhemispheric transcalosal approach. This procedure gives access to the atrium and part of the body of the lateral ventricle. As you can see here is the, in the description of the procedure, the, the part of the splenium, one of the structures that has absolutely to be protected during this procedure as part of the corpus callosum. So this, this splenium has to be protected during the procedure, we have the great vein, the great cerebral vein, one of the main draining veins of the, the, the structures in relation to the lateral ventricle. One of the other procedures is the anterior temporal neocortical resection, one of the most preferred procedures by uh, uh, most of the documents I read for resection of uh, uh, temporal lesions. And the transtemporal transcortical approach which gives access to the temporal horn. This approach is mostly dangerous when it, uh, when it is used at the level of the dominant hemisphere. Why? Because this procedure goes through the white, the, the white substance of the temporal lobe. And as we all know, we have the, 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 the venicus area, the 39th uh, Broca's area at the level of the temporal lobe. So, when this procedure is performed at the, at the level of the dominant hemisphere, we have high risks of disturbance, post-operative new neurology deficits at the level of the language. So most of this surgical procedure is best used at the level of the non-dominant hemisphere temporal lesions. So as we see here, it's really a procedure that endangers the, 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 the venicase area at the level of the, temp the temporal lobe when used at the dominant 
hemisphere. So mostly avoided when we have the dominant hemisphere lesions and we pre the, the neurosurgeons prefer using this procedure at when we have non-dominant hemisphere lesions. We have also the posterior interhemispheric transcortical approach, which gives on its own access to the occipital horn. But as it is a transcortical approach, we have high risks of lesion at the level of the occipital lobe. So the main, one of the main precautions here for, use, for using this procedure is if the up, because some patients mostly with this uh, ventricular diseases have visual field defects before the surgical procedure. So in case uh, the patient has these visual field defects and we are sure that we, with the surgical procedure, will bring in no new post-operatory uh, neurologic defects, it, it can be a safe procedure. So with the third ventricle, we have uh, various, be it uh, the transphenoidal approach, we have transcalosal approach, transcortical approaches. One of the most used approaches is the anterior interhemispheric transcalosal through the callosum, expanded transforaminal through the foramen of Monroe and transvenous transchoroidal approach. Another procedure is the anterior transfrontal transforaminal approach. So with the third ventricle, with the fourth ventricle, on the other hand, one, the best approach used for the fourth ventricle is uh, the telovelar approach. It really uh, provides safe access to this fourth ventricle and then a uh, 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 precautious presentation of, the, of the, the, the vascular structures to be preserved, protected during the surgical approaches. So that was all about the, the, the surgical anatomy of the, of the lateral ventricles and the ventricular system. Thank you. Excellent, Dylan. Well illustrated, uh, well explained, very professional. Thank you very much. And, and you learn one of the lessons I'm sure Marker will tell you. Sometimes the machinery doesn't work in the OR or there's a there's some kind of something that doesn't work and doesn't help to get excited. Just stay cool like you did today with the tech. So uh, we have a couple of new arrivals. I'd like to introduce um, Jan Kana. Can you hear me, Jan? Can you hear me, Jan? Yes, I'm heard. Yeah, Kai. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, I'm Jan Kana. I'm a medical student. Okay. I'm America okay. from Cameroon. Oh, okay. You're from Cameroon also. Great. We have a lot of Cameroon people here. That's great. Okay. Uh, and Daniel, we met him from the Congo. Claudio, have we met you yet? Claudio, can you hear me okay? Uh, and Innistar, Innistar, are you there? Innistar? Yes. Um, I'm Intisar Hisham from Kenya. Currently oh, a pediatric. I'm um, a pediatric surgery resident. Excellent, excellent. So uh, what part of Kenya, what, uh, we, we, we've televised from- uh, uh, Kenya Nairobi. Before. Nairobi, okay, Nairobi. Yeah, yeah yes. we, we actually televised from the beach area. Mombasa, oh, is it? Uh, the, yes, yes. Yeah, Mombasa, yeah, we one of them. There last year, a neurosurgery oh, okay. okay. so, Yeah. There was even a, 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 pre a presentation a couple of weeks back by Dr. M uh, Professor M Mohamed um, Qureshi on oh, endoscopy. Yeah. From Kenya. Yes, oh, yeah. that's right. Excellent. Yeah, we'll have to send uh, her a copy of that. Make sure we have your e we have your email address, right? Okay. Yeah, um, in, in Ulrich. Tomorrow, we have your email address. I'll send it to Ulrich. Yeah, just put it. Yeah, just send it. Yeah, please do that. And that way you keep in contact with all the conferences that are happening. Okay. So, Marco, okay. any comments for uh, Dylan? Well, uh, simply uh, a great uh, job, Dylan. Very complete uh, uh, the description of anatomy and uh, most important, the uh, relationship with surgical approach that are not always obvious when you have uh, some lesion uh, uh, of the uh, of the ventricle. You need to be uh, very careful to uh, consider the approach, uh, considering the side, considering the site of the of the of the lesion.
So uh, absolutely uh, my, my best compliment. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. From, go ahead, go ahead. Thanks so much, Marco. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, you know, Marco, just being from around neurosurgeons, they have to know neurosurgery cold. It's not a question of just be know a little bit. You have to know it. I mean, period. That, that's, you know, that's, that's what I'm getting impressed, more impressed about the, the uh, neurosurgery. And it's so good to have presentations like that, Dylan, and reinforcing it. I'm sure, Dylan, the rest of your career, you'll be refreshing on lectures like this. Uh, yeah. And other people will be watching it, too, for the first time. Any other comments or questions, Arsene or Ulrich, any, anything for Dylan? Uh, yeah. Um, like, like Dr. Meloni, um, I have the same opinion. The, the, the presentation was fantastic, was wonderful. Uh, he he made us even forget all the technical issues actually, because we had so much neurosurgery, um, neuroanatomy, um, surgical uh, approaches and everything. It was really really complete complete. Um, we would have we would have loved to have uh, Dr. Nuru today, who was going to talk about hydrocephalus, and it would have been more complete. But he he's very busy, so we sh we scheduled it for next week. So next week Natalie will be presenting. And uh, Dr. Nuru will be talking about hydrocephalus. So it'll be really interesting. And we equally love the turnout. The turnout yeah. today was- It was good it was, today. Was, was, A lot of the Cameroon students. Unfortunately, um, uh, as we can see, mobile broadband is not the greatest. So a few of them had to all the time come and go off. So we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there definitely. Well, yeah, well, we're on the right path, Phil, Rick. We're on the right path. And so I think once again, once again, th thanks to Dylan. He, he really did a great job. Yeah, it was, he it was wonderful. It was amazing. Uh, I think all those who came today saw, saw the kind of work we, we, we are expecting from them, and I think they will continue in that, in that lane. Great. We hope to show the rest of Africa work like this, and uh, we'll, we'll work on that. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to edit this, and uh, we'll take out the rough spots, hopefully, and you will get a good presentation, Dylan. The question about um, having uh, access to the presentations. Obviously, you can have access to the presentations. No worries. So you will. Uh, I think you you're in the WhatsApp group, so you can just hit up uh, Dylan, and he will send you the presentation. No, no, uh, no stress about that. We equally received um, some textbooks from Dr. Marco, who was really kind and gave us um, some textbooks. I think Dylan has them. So if you get in touch with, with Dylan, you equally have access to those textbooks. So that when you decide to do a presentation, you can have all this fantastic information and uh, present like one of the top world specialists. So thank you very much. Okay, we'll be sending us to Victor, Dylan. Uh, he's the man. He's the man. I'm sure he'll like it. Uh, okay. And, and okay, once again, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Solrick, for organizing the series. Uh, I think it's a great concept to organize topics in a series. Uh, it gives us a little structure. And, and thanks to all the panelists and Marco, once again, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll just wrap this up. So stay here, stay around. I'm just going to wrap up the recording. Thank you.